Hello, my miraculous friend, and welcome to another episode of the Magnify Your Miracles podcast. This is Reverend Francis Faden, and I'm so grateful that we get to spend this time together helping you to magnify your miracles. Today, we have a guest that I'm so excited to share with you today, and we're going to be talking about something that nobody that I know is talking about, but is so important to help you experience more miracles in your life. But before we do that, let's take a few deep breaths together. Just get ourselves grounded and centered. If you're driving, please keep your eyes on the road, but you can always bring your awareness to your breath. And as we do this, we start to come into this moment and we know that the present moment is where the divine dwells, always here with us. And knowing that whatever you need to hear today to help you magnify your miracles is exactly what you're going to hear. Let's take one more deep breath in gratitude and we can begin. All right, my friend, well, welcome once again to the Magnify Your Miracles podcast. If you have been a fan of the podcast, if you've been listening, you will recognize today's guest because she's been on twice before <laughs> uh, with her husband, but now we get to have her all to ourselves, which I'm so excited. It is, um, such a joy to be able to share what we're going to be sharing with you today. So let me introduce you to my friend, Perdita Finn. She is the co-author of The Reluctant Psychic and with her husband, Clark Strand, The Way of the Rose, The Radical Path of the Divine Feminine Hidden in the Rosary. Love that book. Her new book, Take Back the Magic, Getting to Know the Dead, will be published in the fall of 2023. She's a longtime devotee of Mother Earth. Perdita has also studied with mystics and shamans, Zen masters and naturalists, but her greatest teachers have been the dead themselves. We're going to talk about that. She's the co-founder of the Way of the Rose, an international rosary fellowship dedicated to the earth and to the lady by any name that you like to call her. And you can find out more about her work at wayoftherose.org, which we'll be telling you a little bit more about that as we go on. So please help me welcome Perdita. Yay. And says, thank you so much for having me on. It's always a delight to talk with you. Oh, my friends, we could be on for days. Um, <laughs> it's so amazing to talk to you. And I'm just so grateful because I know how busy you are. And I know that you your service is just so big in the world. But, um, it, you know, I just want to let people know that, you know, it caught my attention. I know you you offer this this beautiful training of connecting with the dead. So before we even get into anything, I just would like you to explain to me, people, what do you mean by the dead? And when you say specifically your dead, which I love that idea, tell us about that before we get into this topic. Okay. If I talk too much, you're going to interrupt me. Okay. I will. So, why do I talk about the dead, which feels kind of scary, right? Like, oh my gosh, the dead. I don't want to think about the dead. I don't want to say the word death. Um, I'd rather talk about my ancestors or my lineage or why the dead? Well, I like the earthiness of the word. Mm -hmm. And what I would advise people to do is to go wherever you are, wherever you live outside after this podcast and pick up a little handful of dirt. And look at that dirt in the palm of your hand because it is the bodies of the dead that made that dirt. Dead leaves, dead trees, dead plants, dead insects, dead beings, dead stones that were made from dead oceans. I live in the mountains far from the ocean and yet in my backyard, I can go and find stone that have little brachiopods in them the bodies of the dead. So when I talk about the dead, I'm talking about those beings that literally are the ground beneath our feet that get us grounded again in this planet, on this earth, and in our lives. I'm not just talking about your grandmother and grandfather, although I am talking about them, but not just them. I want to include all of the souls who have come before us not just the human souls. I love that. Even as you're talking, I feel my heart chakra just like, wow, this getting really big because this is so important, especially with where we are right now on the planet. There's this disconnect from, from the earth. And there's a disconnect from this whole idea of the dead are right here 
all these beings that have been here before, like right beneath our feet. And I think that our unwillingness to talk about it and explore it aggravates the situation that we have on the planet of feeling really disconnected, which makes us disconnected from ourselves. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, I often say that when you begin to become in relationship with the dead, you become to come in relationship to your own life. But I want to I want to give people some maybe some background about why that is. Yes, please. Because I think it's really it. It's not a personal failing. It's a cultural agenda mm. that we've been subjected to. And it's important to understand the kind of genesis of that agenda. For our ancient ancestors who are hunters and gatherers moving across the land, they were in constant conversation with the dead. That's how they knew where they were and where they were going. Mm -hmm. You know, we talk about the song lines of the you know, Aboriginal people in Australia, but for our ancestors, you know, even, even in Europe in the Middle Ages, they had a practice of what's called walking the meets and bounds of a property. And you knew what land belonged to you because you knew the stories of the ancestors on that land. And you could walk the property telling those stories. And that's, you didn't have fancy surveying equipment. You had storytelling about the land. And that's what a song line is. And it binds you, those stories to the land and binds you to the ancestors. And why did we lose that tradition? Well, part of the reason is that very, very uh, practically, as monotheism became ascendant, and I won't go into the whole reason why it does, but monotheism becomes ascendant, and with it, a priestly class. Mm -hmm. And that priestly class wants people to obey them, listen to them, and let them mediate between them and the divine. Mm -hmm. people didn't need any mediation before that mm -hmm. and one of the things that's fascinating is that the priests in the early days of the five and six hundreds were often writing to their superiors saying you know we can't get these people to listen to us <laughs> they keep going to the graveyards to talk to their ancestors and to talk to the dead max dashu the feminist scholar has documented this extensively in her book witches and pagans and People didn't see any need for mediation. Joan of Arc didn't need any mediation. She was just talking to the beings on the other side. By the way, who she didn't identify in the beginning. She just called them her counsel. Mm -hmm. Everyone had counsel on the other side. Mm -hmm. And I would argue that we still do. But the demonization of that counsel was a way of, of, of changing where the locus of power was. Mm -hmm. And that it, we have to make the dead scary if we want people to stop consulting with them. We need horror movies. You, we, you need to be scared of the dead, scared of the devil, scared of all these things. Because otherwise, and you need to come to us to be safe. Right. And yet the safest place we are is outside in the woods at night with the dead. We couldn't be safer. I always say the scariest place for me is a well-lit boardroom in Wall Street, <laughs> not a haunted house. <laughs> I don't find the Blair Witch Project very frightening. People always say the Blair Witch Project was so frightening. I thought, you're out in the woods and there's some dolls in the trees? That seems kind of nice. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> it does not seem like a problem. But yeah, it was a demonization. And then we find in, in the advent of the world, we live in the modern era in the 15, 16 hundreds, there was a, a war against collaboration with the dead. And that was expressed towards women. And it was the European gynocide, the witch craze. The thing women were most often accused of that had them branded as witches was talking to the dead. And by talking to the dead, I mean, talking to my dead mother, talking to my dead grandmother in conversation with the unseen world. And that was, that was literally burned out of women. And we lost that, we, we became very frightened of that. We see in the 19th century, in the rise of industrialization, people who talk to spirits are crazy, right? Now they're going to have it medicated and shocked out of them. Mm. So, you know, if we're frightened of talking to the dead, we have good reason for it. We have been taught to be frightened of the dead, but we've been taught to be frightened of the dead, so we won't be frightened of the living. Interesting. Interesting. That reminds me of that meme that I've seen that says it's like 
you know, why were we uh, afraid, taught to be afraid of the witches instead of the people who were burning them alive? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And that's it in a nutshell, isn't it? Yeah. You know, I mean, I mean, one of the things that, you know, this is we're coming just after Halloween. We look at the Salem witch trials. Now, there were other witch events all throughout. Right. Night. Salem ones always get the most attention. Arthur Miller did a disservice to that experience by making it seem like it was a group of hysterical teenage girls who created this problem. It wasn't. Mm -hmm. It was the good men of Harvard, the Harvard professors who came in and said, identified the witches. Do you know what I mean? They, it was the, the places we see where the witch burnings were worst were in the place where the education was at its highest, Scotland and Germany. Mm. It was those countries most devoted to intellectual academic pursuits that killed the most women. It was, you know, I always say Harvard is the seat of all evil, not Salem. <laughs> oh my goodness. Okay. <laughs> no, really. I believe you. I believe you. I get what you, I get where you're going with that. Absolutely. Absolutely. These, these these are the people who've created a world that's on the brink of extinction. Right. Yeah, that's why I say I get what you're saying about it. It's like it's perpetuating the whole problem that's, yeah, I get it. I totally get it. So given all of that, and given that you yourself are very much a, a, a scholar, I really respect how much research you and Clark both put into things. How did you end up connecting with the dead when there's all this energy to not do that? Like what's <laughs> share your story about that? How did it happen? It's so not an academic story. You know. know, my daughter, my daughter was born and, uh, you know, the portal opens when you have a child, you know, when somebody dies, the portal opens and for everyone there, when someone dies, the portal is very open. And when a baby is born, the portal opens, you know, those are the two moments, birth and death, womb and tomb. I was unprepared for that when my daughter was born. And I went home to my childhood home with my three month old baby and had an epic fight with my mother in the great tradition of our, you know, mm -hmm. and, you know, my mother told me to let the baby cry herself to sleep and that unleashed a lot of fury and rage in me and we started mm. fighting and and the fighting with my mother was upsetting and the baby was crying and my mother was perhaps it had a little too much bourbon and you know <laughs> things were being said that shouldn't be said and I felt so enraged and upset and I went downstairs and I called my husband on the phone this is in the old days you know with old-fashioned telephones and said calm me down and he'd been a Buddhist monk and he said, you need a mantra, baby. You just need a mantra. You got to breathe. I said, I can't breathe. I can't say a mantra. He said, I'm going to give you a mantra. Write it down. I think he knew that, you know, I just needed anything to put some right. space right. between me and the fight. The baby's crying. My mother's crying. Everybody's right. crying. Right. <laughs> I, so I wrote down this mantra on a piece of paper. On ka ka kabi sammai so aka. I didn't even ask what it was. I just said it. He said, say that over. 108 times he could have told me to make a cup of tea and i think it would have worked right, but right. that was what he told me to do and so i went in and i began nursing the baby my daughter and i said the mantra 108 times and it was nighttime and i started to feel women all around me in the darkness Ooh. and I assumed I was imagining it. Oh, I've got such a good imagination. We'll talk about imagination later and what it really is. But I felt these women, I felt generations of women upset and disconnected. Mm -hmm. And I felt the impossibility of motherhood before me with this little daughter in my arms. And something started to break open in my heart as I felt all these women, I didn't even know who they were coming around me in the darkness. And I went upstairs to my mother's bedroom where my mother was crying. And I got into bed and I put the baby between us and I took her hand and said, I was sorry. And I looked up and I realized that in the wall opposite my mother's bed, she had been filling over the past few years, the whole wall with photographs of her ancestors. Ooh. There were all these women 
staring back at us. The women I'd felt downstairs were right there staring at us. And something shifted in me that moment. And I thought, there, I'm not alone in the room with my mother right now. There are grandmothers I don't even know in the room right now with me. And there are mothers I don't remember from lives I don't remember in the room with me right now. And they're going to help me fix this. Mm. And after that, Francis, I began talking to the dead. And I didn't tell anybody what I was doing because I <laughs> didn't think it was easy. <laughs> right. I started talking to the dead and the dead started showing up. And the amazing thing was the mantra that Clark had taught me, the Buddhist mantra was a folk mantra to a little Buddhist saint called Jizo Bodhisattva. And he is considered the saint between the worlds who stands at the crossroads, <laughs> guiding souls back and forth between the living and the dead. Okay. And he's often the saint invoked <laughs> at birth and death. Oh my God. And I started reading about Jizo, but Jizo had not always been a little bald monk. He had once been a young girl who had a terrible relationship with her mother. Mm. And during a fight one day, her mother died. And Jesus felt so terrible about this, her mother dying and going to hell in the middle of this fight, that she prayed to the Buddha to send her to hell to free her mother. And the Buddha said, certainly you can go to hell to free your mother. And Jesus went down to hell. When she got there, her mother wasn't there. And the Buddha said, the moment you wanted your mother out of hell, she was out of hell. But Jesus saw so many other of the dead and said, vow to be reborn forever until all souls were freed from hell. Wow. And did, did Clark know that, that the backstory of that mantra? No. None of it. <laughs> nothing. Nothing. You cannot make this None up. None of it. You cannot None make of it, Francis. <laughs> <laughs> nothing. <laughs> wow, that's amazing. Yeah, it was really, you know, that was 30 years ago. And I began praying to the dead. Now, I say I began praying to the dead because I didn't just pray to my relatives. I began, I would be in a subway station in New York and I would feel the dead close and I would pray to them. And then I would come up out of the subway and there would be a homeless person dying in front of me and the EMT is coming over and I would sit down on the sidewalk and know that it was no accident that I was holding the death of this person in my heart. Mm -hmm. I began to collect the dead and I began to offer them prayers and food and candles. I began to love being with them. It was hard to describe my love of them. Mm -hmm. It's so amazing, this, this, what you're talking about. And I know that there's so many people listening who can relate to it. And they're like, I had no idea this was a thing, that this was a thing. Because so many people talk to the dead. What I want to show people is that the dead are always talking to us. Talk about that. Let's talk about that. That took me longer. Do you know what I'm saying? Like in the beginning, I was summoning. Yeah. And I was offering them prayers. But I think I didn't know how relational this experience was. Mm -hmm. I didn't really. I went one weekend. It was a really transformative weekend for me, probably designed by the dead themselves. I signed up on a whim for this workshop at a local bookstore with an African elder called Maladoma Somme. And he was from Burkina Faso. And he had... He had, he had been born there and then been sent off to France for education in the West and then had gone back to reclaim the initiation and the wisdom of his Dagora elders. And I don't remember much of what he said at the workshop, but except for one thing, he said, the dead want to help. They don't have bodies anymore, but they can help in ways, other ways. And if you give them jobs to do, they will show up. And it clicked something in my head and I realized 
that I had been inviting them to the party, but I hadn't really been talking with them. I hadn't been engaging with them. And so I began giving the dead jobs to do. And to my wonder, they got the job done. And as you have know, you've taken my class with me, it's kind of astounding what happens, how quickly the dead are waiting to show up and to let us know they're real and they're there and they want to collaborate with us on our lives. And that's why I call this work, Take Back the Magic, because the magic, the alchemical magic of the dead and living, working together is quite profound. You know, a woman in one of my classes, um, she, she'd she been out of work and she was getting anxious about her finances and she said to her parents, help me. Within an hour, she'd gotten a call for a freelance job that completely answered all of her financial needs. Mm -hmm. I love I, this. I love this. I, the reason I really want to emphasize this part of our conversation is because, you know, I was raised Catholic. So I was always brought up with this idea that we need to pray for the dead. We need to pray for them because they're on the other side and they're in purgatory or like whatever it might be. But but I've been having, I was having my own experiences and I, I shared some of that with you of like, people started showing up in my sessions and I was like, why, why is this happening? You know, and I had a specific thing happen that I'll, I'll share with you in a little bit, but this, this turns the whole thing on its head rather than it being, they need our help. It's that they're actually here to help us. And I, I love this idea that you you teach that when people cross over their personality is their personality but their perspective shifts and they see things differently and a lot of times they they want to help sometimes they want to make amends right so let me talk a little bit about trauma and the yeah, dead let's talk what about the, it. what it's like to be dead and purgatory in this whole idea because yeah. the whole idea of purgatory is a way of making it you frightened of death right yeah and the dead are in trouble and they need prayers it's dis it disempowers the dead. Mm -hmm. You understand? It makes them a burden. Mm -hmm. And in fact, the church gets involved and monetizes the whole thing so exactly. that you can buy indulgences and free them from purgatory. Well, who's in purgatory? Us. We're in purgatory. <laughs> We're in trouble. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> okay. When you're dead, you're dead. What, it, what does it mean to die? And the way I often conceptualize it for people so much of our suffering comes from our bodily incarnation. The worries, the fretting, the aches and pains, the suffering, the addictions, all of which we're done with when we die. Right. And the other place that our suffering comes from is that we have such a hard time seeing beyond a single life. We just see one life trapped between birth and death and it feels too short, and it feels merciless and unfair and unjust frequently. And that's the cause of our purgatorial suffering. Yeah. But what happens when the dead die, and that's that shift in perspective I talk about, is they see beyond the limits of a single life. Mm -hmm. They see the whole long story of their souls. They see the big picture. And they go, oh, now I get it. Oh my God, <laughs> that makes sense. And they're collecting the wisdom from their past lives. And th that shift in perspective is very, very healing. Now, one of the things the dead can do with us is they can help us shift perspective while we're alive. Right, so important. I mean, I teach a whole course that I'm starting in November called The Long Story of Our Souls, which is about doing just that, to find and drop into that big picture and to really feel its resources within us. So a lot of times people talk these days, and I really take issue with it. I have to heal my ancestors. Well, that is so popular right now. I have to heal my ancestors. Yeah. First of all, it posits us as a superhero, right? right? <laughs> Right, right. <laughs> I don't feel like a superhero, I feel like a mess most of the time. And then the other thing is here I am in some super ho heroic moment. I've got a yank. I, I sometimes imagine it like somebody at the top of Mount Everest and everybody has fallen into a crevasse that I'm roped to. Yep. And if I'm not careful, they're going to pull me over into right. oblivion. Right. So I better hold them up one at a time. 
Who wants to do that? Who can do that? Yeah. The truth is our ancestors have already fallen. They're dead. They don't weigh anything. Right. <laughs> <laughs> right. They can heal us. They have the wisdom of failure. So I'm going to give you an example. Yes, please. I, I am um, over four months sober from sugar. Yay, congratulations. <laughs> and the person who has helped me the most with my sobriety is my best friend's mother who died of alcoholism at age 53. Mm. She was the worst alcoholic I've ever known. Do you know what I mean? A beautiful, brilliant, talented, funny, oh, lovable woman. I mean, somebody I loved with my whole heart as a child, committed to her descent mm -hmm. and unable to get sober and died of a burst esophagus, you know, yeah. from drinking too much vodka, horrible death and, and a tragic life. Well, Rita, her name is Rita. She can talk turkey with me about addiction. <laughs> she knows how to get me sober. And she knew what awaited me if I didn't. Mm. And she is a profound resource for me on the other side. Sometimes people whose lives look abject and miserable have been doing courses of study we barely understand. Mm -hmm. And we can call on people who've been abject failures at things for help we need. And we have forgotten that a life of failure can be a life with tremendous resource. Those are the superpowers. Yeah. Those are the superpowers. And that's what you call on the dad for help with something that you need help with and that we need help. We're the living. And when it's very frightening to admit how much help we have need, right? Our whole culture is about yeah. better and better every day. And self-help, I gotta pull myself up and do it myself. Oh, self-help, and... right? How, how about collaborative help? Yeah. How about communal help? How about I can't do it on my own? I need the help of all the dead and all the living. Well, let me ask you. So you had set that intention to mm -hmm. for that particular thing. How did that particular person come to your mind or how did you, like, what's it like to say, oh, I think I'm going to ask my best friend's mom to help me with this as opposed to any other dead person or being? Did it just pop in your mind or how did it work? Oh, it's a long story. I think it's a whole other book, Francis. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, you don't have to whole... use that example if you don't want to, but I think it would be but, good yeah. for people to know, like, how to, where to start and, like, how do I, how do I know you know, no, I, I, let's talk about the pop into my mind. Okay. We all know. And yeah. part of this work is beginning to strengthen our own intuitive powers. Yes. And that brings me back to imagination and intuition. Tell us. Ima you know, people can say, oh, it's just my imagination. Well, my best, one of my dearest friends is an extraordinary psychic. She has a hard time telling the living and the dead apart. And she says, imagination is just talking to the dead. She says the best novelists are just channelers, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> they're just tell, you know, they're just telling the stories of the dead in their own way. And in fact, I actually teach a course I'm doing right now. It's extraordinary of getting the dead to tell people their stories. And the writing that's emerging is just blowing my mind. That's so amazing. Right? Like if you can open up and let the dead work with you, it's amazing what can happen. So imagination and then intuition. Mm -hmm. The dead strengthen our own intuition. We know. We know. You know, I was, I to be perfectly honest, I was, I was having terrible reflux. And I got worried I had cleaned up the mess when my best friend's mother had died of a burst esophagus. And I was worried about my esophagus. Mm -hmm. That makes I thought, sense. Rita's going to protect my esophagus. Who better? Ah, that makes sense. Yeah. Right. You know, and, and so, you know, I've seen what, I've seen where this can go when it's not, doesn't get taken care of. Yeah. But I went to her grave and I brought her roses. Mm -hmm. You know, I love her. And the other thing is I loved her so much when I was alive and broke my heart. Yeah. Yeah. 
I can imagine. But I wrote her daughter and said, do you have a photo of her that was her favorite photo of herself, which she sent to me? Hmm. I do keep an ancestor altar. You probably see it behind me. I was going to ask about it. And I was going to say, tell people, tell, tell us about the ancestor altar, because this is such a beautiful and simple way that you can get started with inviting this energy to be more present for you. Make space for the dead in your house. People always have. People always have. When we went to India, every time someone crossed over, there's an altar with a person's picture. It wasn't just for your guru. It's like, there's your grandfather. There's your grandmother. It's like it, everywhere. Grandmother and grandfather are so much better than a guru too, because they're not going to take your money and sexually abuse you. You know, that's what I always say yeah. about the dead. Yeah, <laughs> you know? I hear that. <laughs> Stay with the dead. They're really good. They don't take your money. Um, but yes, you know, the ancestor altar for, for our most ancient ancestors, the land was their ancestor altar. They walked the land telling the stories of the dead mm -hmm. and the dead were everywhere in their passages. They were telling stories that were tens of thousands of years old about their ancestors. For when our ancestors began to settle down and to stay in places, the ancient Natufians in the Middle East, they would bury the skulls of their ancestors into the floors of their homes. Wow. So you talk about picking up that dirt and thinking about the dead burying you up. They put the bones of their ancestors now we we can we can go like ooh that's creepy ooh that's yeah but for people who did not have photographs yeah the only real object you had as a memory of your ancestors would be their bones and in some cultures you would take a lock of hair a bit of a finger bone you would make a relic yeah we see that in the saints right 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 then it seems morbid and creepy or right yeah <laughs> but in fact you know photographs are what we have today make space for the dead maybe it's an ancestor altar or an ancestor room as it's becoming in our house <laughs> <laughs> i get more and more dead everywhere or it might be um, i make for my nieces and nephews i made ancestor books filled with photographs and stories of their ancestors and amazingly the kids all took their books with them to college and take them on with them on trips because they don't feel lonely, they said. Oh, I love that. You know, it might be as simple as just a little table. I always say with this, you don't have to start grandiose. You can start very, very small. My mother, who had no spiritual or religious inclinations, had an entire wall filled with photographs of the dead. Mm-hmm that she went to bed looking at and talking to. Mm -hmm. This is our first spiritual impulse. Yeah. I think that's, it's amazing. And it's something that you could, you know, people can easily do. Just dedicate a little space, invite them in, have a little chat when you're drinking your morning coffee or tea. And there you go, right? You can also have a relationship to your local cemetery. Get yes. to know the dead in your local cemetery. I, I, you know, people used to know be buried in their own backyards. That was the ancestor altar. Right, right. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And here on the East Coast, it's like everywhere. Like you're just driving down the street and you see, you know, cemeteries and headstones that say like, you know, 1801 on them and, you know, things like that. Like you can barely read them. They're just everywhere. You know, I just had the most fun thing. My son has moved to Cambridge and just before I went up to visit him um, this summer, a psychic friend called me and said, I don't know, this man is coming through. He's the husband of your godmother. He smokes a pipe. I said, Rab. She said, very tall guy. I said, yeah, very tall. It's like six foot seven. She said, he's watching over your son. And I thought, God, that's so strange because he died when I was a teenager. Do you know what I mean? Why was he interested in my son? I said to the psychic. She said, he likes him. I said, Okay. <laughs> <laughs> whatever i'll go with it right right so my son and i there's a giant cemetery near where he lives and we went he said let's go for a walk in it and a very beautiful called mount auburn cemetery but it's hundreds of acres do you know what i mean like and i said you know i think rab is buried in the cemetery and 10 minutes later my son said oh he's right over here 
It's amazing. Uh, he found the grave of somebody who had died when I was a teenager. Do you, you can't make this stuff up. You can't you know I mean? make it up. Nope, you can't. So every morning now I call in Rab to, when I feel worried about my son who's four hours away, I know that he's got a good pipe smoking, <laughs> six foot seven Scotsman taking care of him. <laughs> I love that story. I love that story. I want to share a couple of stories. Um, Please. So I took your class, which I recommend to everybody. It's amazing. And we'll tell you a little bit about how you can find out about um, the things that Pradita is offering because she offers things throughout the year. Um, but, you know, through the process of the very first class where you talked about, you know, connecting with the people and creating the altar. So I started to look because I'm the youngest in my family and a lot of people had crossed over by the time I was born. So I did like I don't know either grandfather or anything like that. And through that process, I looked to see and I found out that my great grandfather, who I didn't even know, is buried like an hour from me here in Pennsylvania. And coincidentally, <laughs> well, the thing about it is for the last five years, I've been like, why am I in Pennsylvania? <laughs> like, How did I end up in Pennsylvania of all the places in the world? And I'm like, oh, my great grand, like there's a vibe here. There's some kind of I'm like, oh, interesting, coincidentally. But I want to share this story with you because this is part of what was happening for me is people on the other side kept showing up for me. And I was always like, OK, I just thought, like, this is just a random thing. I guess this is my I'm in this business, so I guess this is just happening. But I had this very specific thing happen, Pradita, I wanted to share with you is that I have an uncle who passed away in um, World War II mm -hmm. in 1945. And um, I don't, you know, obviously didn't meet him. It's my, my father's older brother um, was really sad. He was like 18 and got in the army. And then like four months later, he was killed but like right at the end of the war. And I don't ever think about him. I don't ever like, he's not top of mind for anything. And this past April, for some reason, I don't know what was going on, but for some reason I was like, huh, I wonder where, I wonder where, if I can find any information about uncle, my uncle Michael. And I went online and I looked and I've done this randomly here and there, but I went online and I looked and lo and behold, I found a page that had a picture of him, Perdita. And here he was, handsome young man, in his little uniform with his crew, his air, you know, because he was in, I guess it was uh, Air Force or whatever it was called back then. And I was looking on the day that he died, April 9th, 1945. And I even get chills now when I'm saying it. I'm like, oh my God. And he died like three weeks before the end of the war, something like that. But I was like, oh my God. Now I'm like, I don't know why he wanted me to connect with him, but obviously, he made his presence known to me on the anniversary of his crossing over. And so now I feel like, hey, my uncle Michael, like, hey, I have a connection with this beautiful soul that I don't even know. But that's the kind of thing when you're talking about magic. Can't make Princess, it up. Princess, I hear this all the time. Can't make this it kind up. of thing happens all the time. And if, I mean, I had full chills when you were telling it. And the thing about your uncle Michael, he didn't get to meet you. He died too young, right? And yet he wants to be alive for you mm -hmm. and he's going to be alive for you. And you're going to be able to tell stories about him and the miracles, you know, you say magnify your miracles. Yep. This is how we do it. That he's going to show up and make me together. You two can collaborate on miracles. Yeah. And so a life that was cut too short by terrible violence can continue from the other side. Yeah. It's amazing. It's just, it's so much more than just like, you know, genealogy. It's like, it's, a, it's this whole other, whole other way of being. A lot of times, you know, I, I have been an ancestry.com geek for sure. And, but you don't, you don't get what you want because you start getting lists of names. Right. You don't get the magic. Right. And what I want to show people is how to start making the magic happen with those names. And it doesn't always, it's not always blood relatives. I mean, that's why I teach a course in reincarnation, because we have mysterious connections that we don't even understand. You know, I mentioned the homeless person. I arrive up out of the station just as he's dying. But who is to say I don't have some connection to that person that I honor at that moment? What I have to say to myself is 
this is a child of mine dying on the street. I need to drop to my knees and start praying right now. Mm. Yeah. You know, and, but, but mostly it creates wonder and fun and magic. You know, you can, you can get a lot of things done with the dead. They can, they can sneak in through locked doors. Yeah. They can get real people to answer the phone when you call someone. I can, I mean, I can tell you the miracles that happen. People yeah, give, give us some, give us some miracles. Oh, there's so many. There's <laughs> so many. I mean, I know. you know, I mean, people are, people write to me about, you know, a woman wrote about praying to her mother for healing with her daughter. And that night her daughter called her. Do you, mm-hmm. and you, it's that readily available. my nephew was visiting me last weekend and he wants to get an apartment in the hudson valley uh, oh no right now the hudson valley is the hardest place to move to we've just been airbnb and everyone from new york is living here it's very expensive right. so hard to find places so i but the first thing i said to him was who's going to help who's on the team and he knows me enough and he told me he's half Israeli and he, he told me about a relative on his mother's side, a great, great aunt who had come from the Ukraine as a young woman to Palestine mm. and had managed to buy an entire apartment building through her hard work. And because she bought that apartment building, she got everybody from the Ukraine to come over and have a place to live. And the family still owns the apartments today. Wow. Wow. And I said, he said, that's Aunt Bronya. I said, I think Aunt Bronya will find you an apartment. <laughs> Sounds like this woman is resourceful. <laughs> I think Aunt Bronya can do it. Not 10 minutes later, Francis, a friend of mine put out a message on Facebook saying, I'm leaving my apartment in Woodstock and I need to break the lease. Do you know anybody who would want it? <laughs> of course. And of course, she's an older Jewish woman of who course. is thrilled to have this young boy come over who can speak Hebrew and English and sit down with her and have tea. And of course, of course, it. right? I that, love it. Every day, every single day, I can tell you one of those stories. Awesome. Well, like I said, we could talk and talk for hours, but I know we need to we need to wrap things up. And so for people who want to really explore, if they really want to go deep with you, if they want to learn what's going on, I know you have a couple of things. So this, this is actually coming out on the Day of the Dead. Thank you, Divine Mother, for orchestrating that for us. Um, <laughs> and you have some things coming up in November of 2022, but you also have a lot of things going on in 23 and also just ongoing. So tell us what's going on in November. And then let's talk a little bit about January and then in general, what's going on. Absolutely. So I teach a kind of foundational class in my work called Getting to Know the Dead. And uh, I'm offering that class in November through the Row Conference Center. And you can find the link to that class on my website, wayofthe-rose.org. And But you can also go to the Row Conference Center. It began on November 1st, but each session is recorded if you wanted to join late. Okay. Um, I'm also going to be offering the introductory course I just remembered through a marvelous institution in New York called Morbid Anatomy. <laughs> That's hysterical. They, morbid Anatomy is marvelous. They offer a lot of classes in tarot and folk magic, and I will be teaching through them in January. Okay, good. So and I'll be offering my foundational class in January through Morbid Anatomy. Okay. Um, again, that will be up on my website as well. So you can just go to wayoftherose.org, classes with Perdita Finn, and you'll find it there. Um, in November, I'm also offering starting next week on November 9th, a course on reincarnation. And how do we access the multitudes within us? Right. And not just the trauma. Sure, there's trauma. If you're a human being on this planet, you've got an ancestry of trauma. Right. But you also have older, wiser selves within you. You also have really a lot of healing potential to tap into, too. Yeah, absolutely. How do we tap into all of it? And that's a very experiential class and very much designed to pe- help people access their own inner intuition and imagination. Awesome. And I teach okay. I teach many, many different workshops over the course of the, the year, but it's all designed 
to get to know the dad and really collaborate with them in all kinds of ways to make miracles happen in your life. And that's what we're all about, miracles. Speaking of which, um, I really want you to mention the one that you're offering in January. It's the one that I definitely want to take, Saints Alive. I want to hear about this one. <laughs> Saints Alive has been a very popular course. And, you know, that practice of talking to the dead and asking for their help is preserved in the Catholic relationship to the saints. The right. saints are nothing but ancestors who've made a difference. Right. You know, Joan of Arc wasn't sainted for 600 years. I know. But people were calling on her and asking for her help all during that time. Right. They were devoted to her. Right. And so in this course, I invite people to identify an intractable problem in their lives. The impossible not. That thing you cannot eh, right. get loose. And we put together a team of holy helpers to work on it. And that includes traditional saints, secular saints. I personally have a devotion to Princess Diana. I, I love that. I will justify and explain it. Um, and uh, she's been working great miracles. And also personal saints from your own ancestry. And we all have personal saints and our families. And what happens when you assemble a team of ancestors? And what does traditional devotion to those ancestors look like? And that includes learning how to create summoning spells, uh, make offerings, go on pilgrimage. Uh, it's a lot of fun. And we always have a lot of miracles to report by the end. So fun. I love that. That's called Saints Alive. Yeah. And that's an eight week intensive. Okay. And that starts in January of 2023. So I'm putting all of this, I'm writing notes because I'm putting all of it into the show notes for people. So you can have it there as well, but you can also go wayofthearose.org and you'll see it right on the top. It'll say classes with Pradita Finn right on there. So we'll send people there as well. Yeah. And then I list all the classes and I do a lot of other ones and, and uh, I'm doing a class. I'm finishing up a great class right now called Time Travelers, which has been just a blast with people who had done the course on rebirth and reincarnation going in an even deeper dive and in their art practice, fascinatingly, been kind of amazing. Very interesting. Very interesting. Very interesting. All right, my so, friend. Well, any last thoughts before we, before we close today? Only that I think this, if we can bring back these conversations into the world between the living and the dead, I think we'll have everything we need for the days ahead. Mm. You know, sometimes the world can feel very scary. Yeah. Particularly now. But our ancestors have seen it all. Yeah. They've lived through wars. They've lived through climate change. They've survived ice ages and floods. Yeah. Like super eruptions. Right. They'll get us through. They're standing ready to guide us through whatever the world throws at us. And with their help, there's nothing we can't do. Yeah. Amen. I love that. Well, thank you so much, my friend, for being here and for the beautiful work that you do and how much it's enriched my life and everybody that you come in contact with. It's just you're such a bright light on the planet. And I'm just really grateful for your time today. Thank you so much. Well, thank you, Francis. I love talking to you more than anything in the whole world. <laughs> <laughs> and we could just keep doing it and doing it, but we could. <laughs> we have to thank wrap you. up for today. All right, my friends. So I just want to say to everyone who's listening, please, if you're at all drawn to this work, which I think everybody needs to know about it, go over to wavetherose.org and really check out Perdita's classes and see if they resonate with you. And you'll probably find me in some of those classes with you because I love this work and I'm really opening up to this whole thing and how Divine Mother is wanting me to serve in this kind of way. I think it's just so fascinating. If you did enjoy this episode, please share it with any friends that you think might enjoy it. Friends, family, post it on social media. I would so appreciate that. And remember the key to magnifying your miracles is to always know that your miracle, just like the dead, are already here. <laughs> Thank you much, my friends. Bye-bye. <laughs>